Welcome to At the Movies with Lo and Mo. Episode five. Episode five. Time. Episode five. First take. On my own. That is worthy of a like on the video. First take. He did it, everybody. We're so happy. We're so proud. <laughs> we have been bouncing back and forth throughout the 80s, throughout these uh, filmographies, but we are currently stuck in 1983. Mm-hmm. Um which was this actually the same year as as Videodrome? Yeah, I think so. Which is weird to think about. That so. is, yeah, it is weird to think about that. Um, they, I mean, I don't know. I guess we'll have a better idea when we start making our own movies. But that seems like quite a bit. I mean, I'm sure Videodrome went through filming in '82, and maybe this came out at the end of '83. Um, but, but I mean, when you have all the time uh, devoted to filming and you have your crews and you have everything going, it's a little bit easier than, you know, kind of the constraints that we have when we're filming stuff. So, hey, we'll see. Definitely. Uh, and in case I didn't tip you off, uh, today's episode is about David Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. Not to be confused with the film. TV series. This isn't about the TV series. Or novel which it's based on. So this movie is kind of a triple threat it is a Cronenberg film. It is a Stephen King adaptation and it stars Christopher Walken. So you kind of got three big things going on there. And then I would also say like the cast is really impressive. They got Tom Skerritt, uh, Brooke Adams, fame. Yep, Brooke Adams, Brooke Martin, Adams, Martin Sheen. This is a weird one. I like this movie. Uh, but I do have some, some nitpicky issues with it. I don't think it's a bad film, um, but it's different. Uh, did you watch the trailer before you watched this? Did you have any idea going in what it was going to be like? I didn't, but I just want to point out to our viewers that Aaron and I did not try to call each other before we decided what we were wearing, but we're wearing <laughs> kind of a similar style. <laughs> sweaters. Some sweaters. It's casual. It's casual Sunday, baby. It's kind of funny. Look good, feel good. Because that happens to us. Scaries but that happens to us a here. lot in our friendship, which is funny to me that it happened on this episode. We do have a lot of black shirts, tan pants. Yeah, I mean, me too. That we that we that we share. We don't share pants. pants are your pants. We don't share pants. My pants are your pants. My pants are your pants too, bud. Casa su casa. Me leg holsters, su leg holsters. Um. So, did you watch the trailer? I did not watch the trailer, no. I kind of went right into it. Yeah. Got to start watching the um, trailers again, because the Videodrome trailer really set me set me on the right track, so maybe that's something we should start doing, so we could talk about that and how it kind of goes yeah. with the movie. Did you? Definitely. I know, but I had seen this once before, Okay. and I had the same feeling and the same thoughts that I did the first time I watched it. It was about Two years ago. So your mindset um, didn't really change there. on your second watch through. You kind of felt the same way. No, here's what I'll say. I, I thought it was weird the first time I watched it. But I was definitely it's not like I didn't enjoy any explicit part of the movie, but rewatching this, like I really like the first like act of this movie. Yeah. Uh like I really like the the, the process of him of uh Christopher Walken's character, Bonnie, being in a car accident and discovering these powers and this love story that's kind of unfolding. And then eventually he uh, falls into a coma and wakes up five years later and has these newfound psychic abilities. Um, I w- I'll just come out and say it because I think this is going to be the biggest talking point of the episode. Uh, the structure of this movie is very strange. Yeah, that was my biggest and issue I had a with theory. this movie. Okay, yeah, and no, you were telling me that. This. We were watching it. So, Stephen King books are often very long. Uh, the original page count on this is 440 pages. Okay. Um, so, initially, they adapted the screenplay, or they adapted the novel once. Mm-hmm. And... Yep. Uh, Cronenberg and they, they, the studio was not happy with it. They wanted Stephen King to do it. So Stephen King wrote his own script. Cronenberg actually passed on it because he said it was needlessly brutal, which is interesting to me because Cronenberg stuff is very heavy and dark. I never thought there'd so be a I'm single curious. time there'd be a quote from Cronenberg that says needlessly brutal. That's interesting. Right. 
I don't know what they, I know that there is some stuff from the book about him having like a brain tumor at one point that got cut. Um, at the the third take on on the script, the screenwriter that they went with said that he read the novel and to him it was a triptych, uh, which means like a three part, uh, essentially like a series of three acts, like an episodic. He said the book was kind of episodic and he wanted to do the film the same way. So in that sense, he definitely succeeds. He did. It's just whether or not it works for you. I and I think for me, it still feels kind of weird. Um, I think it's, I mean, I, I like knowing that it was his intent because mm-hmm. I think that that at least shows that like it was done on purpose. And like I said, I think he succeeded. It kind of, to me, feels almost like three episodes of television, like stitched together. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to bring up. That was my sticking point through this whole thing. It seemed like we were watching um, like a TV series kind of like just blended together um, as one single like show um, with how it just broke everything up. It seems like it picked up and dropped off plot points like quickly. And then like later on, it would just like either come back or we would never see it again. I mean, literally the only the only one that carries throughout the whole thing is his relationship from the beginning of the film. Rest of it, like the middle portion of this film, Tom Skerritt shows up as the sheriff and asks for his help solving murders in Castle Rock. And there's no mention of this beforehand. He just goes like, so, you know, about these murders, right? And Johnny's like, of course. And then they they like midsection of the film is just them. Trying, like they go solve this murder and once they do once that part of the film is done it's never revisited in the last no, no it's not and the crazy thing is is like when you're writing a movie or when you're writing a script you usually start out with like an inciting incident which which is the car accident and then you let uh, the viewers kind of understand how the world operates which they do and the when he first touches that nurse and he sees her daughter being in that house fire and then they kind of work towards a goal or they work towards something but we think that it's the love interest but then that's dropped like right as like the coma thing happens it's not picked up again until his mother passes away and we see um her back sarah back at um his dad's house with uh, other kid and they have that crazy love scene there that's going on and then that's where it ends. As far as I'm concerned, that's where that, like, that's where that plot ends. Like this love story ends. I mean, it is revisited later on, but the only, the only time it's really revisited is like the end of the film. When, when spoiler, I mean, obviously, but uh, when Johnny is shot and killed at the end of the film, she says, I love you. There is this kind of tragedy to them being together and him falling into a coma five years and her leaving. And there's kind of this limbo of them. Oh, they won't. They, they clearly still have feelings for each other, but she's married and and has kids. And then there is kind of this tragedy at the end of the film of, of, you know, her finally coming to terms with her feelings and telling him that she loves him uh, as he's passing away. But I'm not, I like the chemistry. Did he pass away, I Aaron, like or did he enter the dead zone? That's what I want to know. Wow. Wow. The performances. I like Christopher Walken. I don't think I've seen many Christopher Walken films. I've seen Pulp Fiction. And the embarrassing thing is, like, I have seen him in, like, Joe Dirt and, like, Click, like, Happy Madison movies. I don't know that I've seen that many actual performances from him. And to see a younger performance from him is pretty interesting. And yeah. I, I really think it's actually a, a, a really strong performance. When he's at the father's home, when he sees that vision of the ch- children's hockey team breaking through the ice and he grabs his cane and smashes the thing and he's like, the ice yeah. is going to break. And it's like, wow, I was just like surprised to see that. Like, that was a great much, moment. Much passion out of him as an actor. I think the directing is fine um it doesn't feel like a cronenberg movie to me outside of the fact that it was filmed in toronto and it does still have that kind of 
me it's kind of has that drab look that wintry cold kind of atmosphere yeah Um, i personally if you were to so if you were to set this movie in front of me and i was to watch it with no background i didn't know who uh, directed it and at the end of the movie you were like all right i want to know who uh, directed this film i would not guess cronenberg because it seems like you know in previous episodes we've talked about like the body horror that he does and kind of this like cerebral approach to directing these films this seems like it was his first big budget film that he needed to pull off and it was like a watered down version of a cronenberg film and I think he did that so he could expand his reach. And, you know, I mean, obviously with, uh, you know, the production company uh, behind it, they want the reach expanded. So I just think it was like a bigger budget film. So they had to had to uh, deliver and kind of lose a lot of that, like Cronenberg esque feeling to this movie. Yeah, this is the film that he did before the fly. And I do. I agree. I feel like uh, I feel like this is. Videodrome is almost like peak Cronenberg in like the body horror sense and like what he's known for. And then this is kind of like on the other side of that is when he starts, like you said, trying to show that he is um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing trying to show that he is able to tackle larger projects and not everything has to be so gross all the time. Yeah. And um, but because of this movie did so well, um, really positive reviews. Uh, The fly, I will say is, I think an achievement. Uh, I'm excited to watch it because it is half big budget studio film like this and half definitely gross body horror. So Cronenberg's this was almost like his showing that he could pull off a big budget film. So now he gets to bring in more of his own flair to uh, the next one because maybe they trust him a little bit more because he's already had a proof of concept interesting it's cool that's how i feel um but yeah the direction is fine i don't think there's anything particularly cronenbergy about it i think it is kind of just like a it's like a good almost like a good director on autopilot yeah just like this is a this is well directed there's nothing particularly that stands out about it um it's just solid do I also like the the effects? Uh, the the first vision he has about the nurse's daughter Amy being in the burning house, and he like looks in his hospital room and he sees Amy uh, in the hospital room with him, and then we flash back to him and he's in his bed, but his bed is like catching fire. Yeah, I think there are some really cool effects, and I think a lot of those uh, those vision sequences in particular, I think are very strong something they didn't bring back but i thought it was going to carry throughout the movie that first uh, that first vision we see his hair is like jet black slick back which i thought was the that really put me in like oh this guy it really like sets uh, the tone about his visions but you kind of just lose that in the rest of the film which is fine because obviously he has to improve his overall health but i thought that was like when you first see him he's like his eyes are wide his hair slicked back and he's just in that like child's bed as everything's burning around him i was like holy that was yeah. well done. I think uh, I do. The other thing is, I think um, the one thing that the episodic like story structure lends itself to is I think his character arc is actually very good uh, because he is reluctant at first to use his found powers to help anyone because he feels very burnt and very like, uh, you know, very god cheated him he goes he has this really good monologue about how god has he's like you want to know what god did for me he threw an 18 wheeler at me there is this slight like undertone of like religion that's that keeps creeping up in different scenes especially when the kid he's tutoring is reading the bible or reading scripture like that like it's a common theme that keeps coming up and it's interesting because even when he um and we're jumping around a little bit but when he figures out who uh, the killer is um, by going to that uh, gazebo when the girl is murdered and then he's able to track down it was you know one of the other officers that was actually doing uh, the killings and when he holds that officer's mom's hand as they enter the house she she's like the devil sent you you're part of the devil like you're a demon and i was like wow it's interesting kind of how it goes back and forth it's like some people think he's a gift uh, from god while others think that he's sent by the devil and that kind yeah, that's of, interesting. I kind of because the cop, back. the cop, 
the sheriff says the same thing, but on the opposite end, mm-hmm. when he's leaving his house, he says, you know, if God really did bless you with this gift, you should use it. I didn't I notice that. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it goes by whichever way you think, though, is like you either think it's a gift or a curse. And if you think it's a gift, then it was God given. If you think it was a curse, then the devil brought it upon you. If you were to break this down to three acts, first one would be uh, Johnny is a teacher yep. and, and his his coworker Sarah and he have a have a relationship um and he tells her he's going to marry her and they things are going very well and she tells him to to drive safe when driving home one night a lot of foreshadowing early on in the scene which is interesting yeah yeah uh that is when he gets into a an accident when a when an 18 wheeler goes off the road or or flips and um he awakes five years later awakens five years later in a coma and of course uh gonna see it coming but sarah it's been five years and sarah has moved on with her life and Mm. uh she's married and has a has a kid second act of this film involves him after johnny after his mother dies being uh just very feeling like this is a curse and not a blessing uh and and not wanting to have these powers um wanting to stop using them um, you know, the sheriff approaches him to help him solve these murders, and at first he refuses. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after his after his one night reconciliation with Sarah, uh, they they make love, and she spends time with his family. And then he asks if he's going to see her again, and she says, "Not like this." Mm-hmm. And you can tell he's heartbroken about it, and that I think flips a switch where it's like if he doesn't have this in his life, he needs to do something that's going to be fulfilling. So he decides to help the sheriff solve these murders. Yep. Um, and in the process, do they do solve the murder? And as, as low said, it is one of the police officers in the department doing it. So they go to that house and, um, in the process of apprehending him, he shoots himself. The killer does. And the killer's mother, um, shoots johnny technically though um, the killer doesn't shoot himself he has that scissor scene is that what it was yeah I figure out what i was looking at yeah so basically what we see is is we see uh him in the bathtub ready to kill himself and he puts the scissors down on like this plate in the tub and goes to put his hand in the back so we assume that he then shoves his head through the scissors going this way and then it goes and flashes away from that, come back, and we see him curled up with the scissors still here and all the blood coming out of his face. Wow, That's what happened. I did not. Yeah. For some re- I, I, I should say I'm not wearing my glasses, but I could not tell what I was looking at. I, I put assume. on mine today. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so that happens, and, uh, and Johnny is shot, but he lives and uh, just has to recover. And the third act of this film totally unconnected once yeah, again both, I mean, that, uh, they were all unconnected it was interesting but kind of connected because you follow johnny's story so right right there is a uh which which again like you, you said there's a tv show and it almost lends itself to that i think where mm-hmm. it's this person that, that would go from week to week and meet new people and, and figure out try to avert danger um the third act has to do with uh a a candidate running for senator, yep. I believe. Correct. Um, and he is kind of a fake, a phony, um, doesn't really care about the people, very selfish. And uh, when Johnny has a vision of, there's some other stuff that is intertwined with this, but the, the big the main point, the main plot point. points. Right. The big plot points are that he shakes this man's hand and has a vision of this man essentially starting World War Three and like uh, starting a nuclear holocaust mm-hmm. as president. And so he buys a gun yep. and he goes to one of his rallies and uh, attempts to assassinate him. The senator grabs Sarah's baby because her husband is like a campaign worker this is crazy. This is like, it's like crazy. Like this is a weird plot point, like a very weird thing, to, weird way to, to make this happen. Grabs her baby and uses it as a human shield so that she, he won't be shot. And some photographers get photos of that. 
and then after Johnny is shot by by security, um, the <laughs> the candidate Martin Sheen goes up to him and is like shaking him, and he's like, "Who sent you?" And uh, Johnny touches his hand and sees that in his future, Martin Sheen, uh, as he has no future in politics. There's this Time Magazine photo of him holding up this baby, using it yep. as a human shield, and he. Kills himself. No future for Stiltson. Uh, no future for Stiltson. No future for Stiltson. And that's it. And that's that's how the movie ends. He's yeah, like, it's done. He's like, my job is my job is done here. So um, uh, so now that we brought up that point, I want to give a chance to ask our viewers a question. And it comes up with the same thing. Like if you could go back in time and kill Hitler, like would you? And it's like the same concept of stories. But if you had the power to understand that one man was going to be responsible for millions of deaths. Would you take action the same way that Johnny did? And I'm interested to see what people would say. So leave a comment to have this question. So I have a question for our viewers. Um, and that is that I was trying to think of films that I could compare this to, because I feel like I've seen other movies. I feel like that do this kind of episodic thing mm -hmm. where it feels like less of a point A to point B and more like there are, you are looking at just this like cross section of someone similar life. to the Lomo show. There's no there's, <laughs> similar. There's no yeah, plot structure. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's similar. Similar. Perfect. Perfect comparison. Um, can't think of any right now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna rack my brain for it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll bring it back up on the next episode. But if our viewers have any thoughts on films that are structured similarly, I'd like to I'd like to hear them. Um, something that I wanted to to touch on that I thought was very interesting was Martin Sheen, the, the candidate goes out of his way at least twice in this movie to say that he had a vision that, that he was going to be president. First, he says, I had a vision. I'm going to be the president of the United States. Then in that flash forward scene that, that Johnny has where he sees him, you know, committing this, this act of like genocide, essentially, he says the candidate says in this sequence says this is my destiny i've seen this this is my destiny so i think it's like really interesting that there is almost kind of like a a false prophet and like somebody who has actually been endowed with these powers that are using yeah. them for good and someone else who i mean i guess say false prophet i could be wrong i'm assuming he is but we never see whether this person has actually had visions or not he could just be like a crazy guy but the idea that there are these two people and we know for sure that one of them is actually having kick visions and eventually uses them for good is fascinating to me yeah it's interesting that you know stilton says that he has to uh, fo you know fulfill his destiny but johnny doesn't want uh, this path that he's on like he doesn't want this like right. destination that he's heading so it's weird that like he just throws himself in and he's like all right i have to stop him even though he doesn't want it stiltson is so determined to live out his destiny which is interesting um overall i would say like there's nothing wrong with this movie in the sense that like it wasn't i thought it was well paced like it is it's kind of one of those movies that you watch and you are not over the moon about but you're just kind of like that was solid everything about it was solid i wasn't bored at all moved pretty quickly um there's nothing at the same time there's nothing that was like blew my mind about it yeah it was a really good sunday afternoon movie film. it was a really good sunday afternoon movie just to kind of pass out the time it was nice to then go ahead and talk about it it was our first time watching and filming in the same day which was cool but yeah it was a good it was a good way to yeah, pass and the I time think, uh, What's crazy is I remember the first time I watched this was also it was like a Saturday or a Sunday morning. And it almost feels like that to me. Maybe I'm just making that connection because those are the times that I've chosen to watch it. But like I was going to sit down on Friday night and suggest a movie. This would probably not be definitely the movie not, that no. I would suggest. However, if it was a Saturday or Sunday and I was just like flipping through channels and I was like, oh, Dead Zone's on. I'm making lunch or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it is a perfectly fine and watchable movie. My Cronenberg ranking would be number one, The Brood. Number two, Videodrome. Number three, Shivers. Number four, Fast Company. Mm -hmm. 
Number five, Scanners. And number six, Rabid. That would be my ranking. Um, I'll tell you what. I put this movie initially, I put this movie sixth out of seven. So I put it between Scanners and Rabid because I like Scanners. I think Scanners can be a little bit slow. I also think that more original and iconic film than this. Um, but the more that we talk about it, the more I think about it. And I don't want to dissuade people from watching this because like I said, I think it's a very no, solid I definitely movie. recommend watching it. I just think the more I think about it, the more I think that it might be my least favorite so far. Um, yeah. Because even if I didn't love rabid, I think that rabid is again, a very Cronenberg film. It is about a woman with a parasite that like comes out of her armpit and like stings people and, and she feeds on people. And it's, it's such, it's, that is a Cronenberg film. The, whether you love it or not, that is a movie where you remember things and it kind of sticks with you. Whereas this is kind of just a movie. Yeah. Kind of just, a kind of just there and not in a bad way or a good way. I mean, it's like, it's a fine watch, but I don't, I, I think that this might be my least favorite so far. Yeah. Which is interesting that our rankings. So our rankings for Scorsese are like me and you have complete opposite rankings on not those films almost, but what's interesting is when we talk about Cronenberg, our rankings are very similar. So with mine, uh, my number one was Videodrome, The Brood, Shivers, Fast Company, Scanners, then Rabbit. So the only one we disagree on really and not even a disagreement, but I put video drone swapped. Yeah. Had, had a brood and everything else is the same. And also f- fittingly enough that I also have put this film at the sixth spot right above um, rabbit similar to you. So I think it's, I enjoyed it a little bit less uh, than scanners. I did agree with you when you said that scanners is a more iconic film other than this one. I think this one's more of like a passing of the time. Uh, where scanners has more things that will always stick with you as far as film. There's not really much to take away from uh, this movie. That's going to sit with you when you watch it. It's kind of like almost forgettable not the movie itself, but a lot of scenes will be forgettable as I watch more and more movies and more and more time passes between uh, these episodes. I will forget certain scenes or in scanners. Well, there's like, a lot more that stick with you. When we watched video drum, you specifically were like, I'm going to be thinking about this for a while. And we said the same thing about After Hours. Mm-hmm. We were like, I wasn't, and I liked that movie, but that was a movie that would like kind of almost weirded me out. And yeah. like, I there were parts of it where I was like, oh, I don't know about this, but I was still like, this is going to be in my head for a while. And this is the exact opposite of that. This is a movie that you could watch and maybe never think about again. Yeah. And sometimes that's what you want. Like sometimes you don't want like a a movie that's going to like destroy your psyche. Sometimes yeah. you just want. And it's a pop a popcorn flick or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, what do we got on the uh the docket for next week? Well, another Scorsese film is gonna be his 1986 uh, The Color of Money starring no none other than Mr. Tom Cruise himself. So it's very interesting. Another drama, another drama in the Scorsese. We're still in that. We're still gearing up before we start hitting these like mob story films. So yeah. there. What I'll say is I am it is technically a sports drama Mm. and i am not a sports guy but i think the world of pool is just niche enough for for it to to be very interesting i'm very curious about this one yeah it'll be a good one i mean i'm definitely excited for it so make sure if you're watching this to make sure that you if you're sticking along i know i've a couple people have reached out to me they're following along and they're watching the movies before these shows so make sure that you watch the color of money before uh the next episode um, and most of all, thank you for everybody who shares these, likes these, comment on these, help us defeat the almighty YouTube algorithm. It helps us out tremendously, just liking and commenting on these videos. Definitely. Um, I do want to ask out of curiosity before we go, um, we have, we have some time before we get there, but have you given any thought to what your next director choice is going to be? I haven't. Well, actually, I kind of have. I kind of have, but I don't know if I really (laughs) want to stick with it. I was thinking maybe Kubrick. 
Okay. I was, I had a thought about Kubrick as well. So that's interesting. I was, I have, I have been thinking about the Coen brothers and I've also been thinking about John Carpenter, but I think I want to avoid doing a second horror one in a row. So I think I'm going to, I think I might go Coen brothers and then maybe return to my old stomping grounds. But uh, yeah, we might need to time. We got some time before that happens. Something that I know that we've thought about, but maybe eventually these will be coming out twice a week so we can move through these quicker because these at the movie segments have been very popular with people. So Oh, and I might be talking about maybe kind of switching gears on the Lomo Unscripted channel, but it's a little sad. Appreciate all the support so far. Um, you know, a like and subscribe, even a share goes a long way. So if you could do that for us, we really appreciate it. The other option we have open for people who are enjoying the series so far is our Patreon, um, which includes Discord access, exclusive Discord access, uh, where Lo and I are actually watching these movies in real time. So if you want to get in on the action, uh, you can visit our website, lomo-media.com, and you can find all of our Patreon information there. Um, you can join our Discord. You can hop in on the conversation while we're watching these films and uh you know get to know our thoughts a little bit before the before the videos come out in the meantime thank you for watching we really do appreciate it um excited to keep keep trucking i'm excited for episode six thank you everybody for watching at the movies five we'll see you in the next one